Uh, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Tiagarajan. He, uh, but most people know him as Tiagi. That's uh, that's how most of you, if you've heard of him before, that's probably how you've heard of him. Um, he has been uh, developing performance-based content, and that has been his focus since he founded his company in 1976. He has worked for a number of uh, very large companies that I'm sure most of you have heard of. He's also worked with organizations like uh, America, the American Red Cross. He's worked with companies like AT&T, IBM, Chevron, United Airlines, Intel. Um, there's probably a, a list that's uh, too long to mention. It would take us all two, two or three hours to actually mention all the, the companies that he's worked with. Uh, he has authored over uh, 40 books, over 200 articles. He has constructed 120 simulations and games, which is one of the things that he is um, just awesome at. And uh, the reason I can say this is I have um, actually been uh, watching and learning from him since 1993 or four. I was working at Intel at the time, and he came in and, and gave a workshop. And it really, truly changed the way I thought about how people could learn and how games could influence um, the ability to, to keep people focused, to help them um, remember things and retain it and uh, be able to apply it. And um, you're going to have a lot of fun today um, learning how to use games, learning how to think very fast and to think how, how to do things very fast. Because he will literally construct an activity that will make a difference in front of you tonight. <coughs> so um, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty exciting and engaging. So I'd like uh, if we could all give a hand to Dr. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to this session. I did. She is accusing me of bait and switch. <laughs> she was looking for you to do this session. Oh, oh that again. Okay. Good. Nice to see so many of you. Hello, Judy. Hi, how are you? I'm doing good. So, what shall we do? <laughs> I'm not actually not into fun. <laughs> and if you don't trust me, check with my wife. <laughs> last week she said the last time we had fun was in 1954. <laughs> <laughs> but I do believe in the training being engaging. I, I do differentiate between fun and engagement. For example, I was in Atlanta training a bunch of hospice volunteers, people working with terminally ill patients on death and dying. We did a simulation and I had, I think, 23 people and at the end of the 45 minute simulation on death and dying, everybody was crying. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely not my definition of fun. Mm -hmm. But they were absolutely engaged because it was personal. They were recognizing what will happen when they die, what are the precious things in their life, and so on. So I may end up making you cry, but uh, <laughs> uh, my belief is nothing can be as much fun as learning. Learning is fun. Learning is fulfilling. And if you happen to laugh as a byproduct of learning, that is great. And I think learning should be accompanied by some kind of emotion. So it should be accompanied by fun, accompanied by sadness. You learn when you cry, you learn when you laugh, but you never learn when you're bored out of your goal. So my campaign is to make sure people don't get bored. So that concludes my session. <laughs> okay, so anybody recall what uh, this evening's session is all about? Instructional design. 
Tips. Ah, tips. Tap it. Instructional design. We can put them in three or four different permutations and combinations. So rapid instructional design. How many of you here are instructional designers? The rest of you came for the dinner? <laughs> Good. And I did, by the way, I'm trying to make sure I don't repeat the jokes I did during the earlier session. <laughs> uh, and this is not a joke, this is a research study. And one of my students checked out 30 different training packages, found out how long it took for the people to design, how much it cost, and how effective it was. How effective by tracking down the application, the return on investment, things of that nature. He found out if the training design took a longer time, it cost more money. The, I could have told him that because the major cost in instructional design is the labor cost. You will have to pay the high paid instructional designers. They are not cheap. You may be cheap, but the real instructional designers are not cheap. But here is the interesting finding. He took the cost and the time compress them on a single index and match them against how effective training is. And he found a correlation, a correlation of 0.6 between the cost and the time spent on instructional design and how effective it is, but in the negative direction. For all of you who are challenged statistically, let me explain. The longer you spend the time in designing instruction, the more money you throw in designing instruction, the more it sucks. <laughs> really, that's what he said. And we kept double checking and triple checking. And uh, it was a challenge to my job security. I keep brainwashing people in advanced instructional design courses on how to do task analysis, concept analysis, front-end analysis, performance analysis, needs analysis, systems analysis, learner analysis, audience analysis, all those analyses which takes three years to do it seriously. And I found out if you do all of those things, your training does not produce as effective results as possible. I know you don't believe it, you can go replicate it and uh, contradict me and uh, write something up and they will take back the CPLP. <laughs> no, actually, I took CPLP examination twice and I flunked both times and I'm very proud of the fact. So. <laughs> uh, but to come back to this, let's for a moment humor the humor me. And can you think, why is it that faster training design produces better life? Let's pretend it is true. Yes, ma'am? Because you don't get analysis paralysis. You're more creative when you just go oh, through okay. instincts. You don't spend too much time analyzing yourself with the analysis. So you get to do it and fast, you don't uh, do all kinds of things uh, like uh, the history and philosophy of iPad or something like that. You just based on what is required. Any other reason why faster training design results uh, in better learning? Is it closer to the actual work? It is closer to the actual work. It becomes as close to on the job training as possible. I'm playing a sneaky game. I'm trying to get out of the camera and he keeps on adjusting it <laughs> while eating his dinner, which is a remarkable level of confidence. Now I will just sit up here and be okay. Good. Okay. 
So that's another reason. Any other reason? Yes, my, yes sir. Well, something I found is that when you have less time to do something, you're forced to become more focused. Yes. Yep. You don't uh, look at all kinds of irrelevant, nice to know, trivia. You just uh, focus uh, on the things which have to be done. Thank you, Brian. Another reason we found, ah, but you going to say something profound back? <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, I was just going to say that it's, it's easier to see, to keep the whole, the big picture in mind and not obsess about the yes. details. Yes, yep. You just to say at the end of the workshop, you'll make more money as an instructional designer instead of saying, upon completion of the workshop, given a typical work situation without using any job aids, be able to state an objective complete with conditions, behaviors, and standard to pass credence in this checklist or something like that. You just look at the big picture and not the nitty gritty details. One other thing we found seems to be correlated with the effective learning is when you work faster, you put more responsibility on the learner. One approach will be to say, hey guys, here is the final examination. We don't care how we pass it, go figure out how to do it. Instead of spoon feeding people, teaching them, so we are forcing them to do all of the hard work. And one simple principle in training design I discovered is that the more the instructional designer works, the more the trainer does work, the less people learn. If you look at the typical instructional design approach, there are the Shmi's, the real gurus who live on top of the mountain. Not everybody can talk to them. You've got to be a fully qualified instructional designer. You trudge up the hill, sit at the feet of the subject matter expert, and he spouts wisdom. You etch it on a marble tablet, you bring it all down, and then you sit down and design a training package. An essential component of that is the trainer's manual. The requirement, it should be 684 pages or more. It should be three ring binder. It should be repetitiously redundant. It should treat all the trainers as total idiots. And it would say things like project slide number 84, display one bullet item at a time. And explain the significance of the item in your own words and however do not deviate from the script. <laughs> and they give everything and I as a trainer go to the room, dim the lights, turn on the PowerPoint slides and mumble my way through. The participants are having a great time because studies indicate after four minutes of somebody mumbling in a semi darkened room, people start having sexual fantasies. <laughs> <laughs> this is real research data done in Stanford University. And at the end, in the smile sheet, they say, we had a great time. <laughs> no other approach. And in the process, the only person who learns is the instructional designer. The subject matter experts know everything, so they don't learn anything new. The learners have a good time, they don't learn anything new. But if the uh, and the trainers are just channeling Shirley McLean to the ordinary audience. But the instructional designer has to sit down, get the gobbledygook, from the subject matter expert and have to process it, translate it, simplify it. So one of the thought I had is if people learn by doing instructional design, why 
why not make the participant experience fractional design of that for the silly idea. So that's what we are going to be doing today. Rapid instruction of design. Hello, I try. Somebody give me a suggestion on how to do rapid instruction of design. Go ahead, be the designated loud mouth, enlighten us. Everybody, an index card. Okay. And have them put an idea on it, what they would like to learn, uh -huh. and put them in groups to create something that will help them learn that. Okay. I like it. Can I have your name? Because your name tag is hidden. My card. Okay. I remember the name. Yes. <laughs> oh, good. Now I remember you. You have a new hat day. Well, it must be a bad hat day. Something like that. <laughs> oh, good. Hello. Yael, how are you? I thought you were an improv person. I am. Huh? What are you doing in serious place like ASTD? We don't let flaky people come inside. <laughs> good. But she has a brilliant idea. Let us implement it. Can you take a card? Actually, can you pass it back to Lisa? Lisa, can you take one and uh, give it to everybody? That's what you don't get. So she said, the index card, I'm going one step further. I have a specially designed input device. Is this bingo? Yes, it is bingo. But not being a Catholic, I don't know how to play bingo. Somebody will have to explain it. Okay. Thank you. Everybody got a card? Yes. Good. Hello, Rohi. I thought you were in charge of uh, registration. <laughs> he moved it in here. <laughs> the crowds are coming right now. You close the shop. Good. <laughs> Excellent. Instructions. Please follow carefully. This card has two sides. One side is formatted and the other side is unformatted. Your job is to use the unformatted side. Hello, Beth. Here is your card. Thank you. Your job. Hello, Olga. Is to use. Okay. When you distribute the handout of like cards, you are supposed to take one for you. Give more can you give one? Another one today, in case you lose up the other one. <laughs> Hello. Here is your secret card. This is not a card, this is a special input device. Use the unformatted side, also known as blank side in lay people's terminology is what you want for you to do. If you got to design training, a training package, very quickly, very rapidly, what would you do? So I want you to write a specific idea on how to speed up training design and write it on the blank side. Do not write a doctoral dissertation. Keep it short. Think of a Twitter and ignore my yakking. If you got the idea, you go do it. I keep on talking, that is because I'm an ASTD member. We keep telling people what to do long after they figured out what to do because I'm an instructional designer. I make a living by increasing the number of words. Okay, Pamela has, oh, by the way, another important thing. 
please, in the portrait format, don't screw it up by writing landscape. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Good. Hello, Brian. I don't have a pen, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. You can even write anything. Good. Diana's finished writing. And if you finish writing faster than other people, have some lettuce, have some salad, or decorate your idea with smiley faces, daisies, crescent moons. Yeah, we get a card, please? Microsoft. Oh, thank you. This is a pre-filled card. Okay, that means I win? Good, thank you. <laughs> so you don't have to do anything more. Okay, wow. good. Side down and then grab your food if you want. That is what you're going to be doing. You're going to stand up, move around, give your card to somebody, get that card, keep exchanging the card, and you'll get totally dizzy. Keep switching cards. And you'll have to move around the whole. That's it, you switch. Uh, switch, keep switching. Switch, move, switch, move. Switch more, switch more, and the switch from other tables and other places. <laughs> Do not read what's on the card, just Partner? Yeah. 
You don't want to switch the partner? No. <laughs> Between you and Ben, how many cards do you have? Two. How many ideas are on those cards? One each. One each. Okay, good. It looks like there's two on this one. If there is more than one, people are not following instructions, cross out the second one. <laughs> Linda and Beth, here is what you're going to be doing. You're going to read and compare the ideas on those two cards. You have a total of seven points to distribute between these two ideas. This is something I learned from Yael. Okay, and if the card Beth has as a brilliant idea, you may decide to give it all seven points. How many points does Linda's idea get? Zero. Zero. This is not a seven point scale. This is a forced distribution of seven points between these two ideas to reflect that relative utility. Okay, seven and zero, six and one, five and two, four and three. Please, no decimals. No <laughs> and there's no <laughs> negative number. <laughs> and yes. the two numbers should add up to seven. When you decided the distribution on the convenient form on the back of the card, where it says round one, opposite to that, you put the number of points awarded to that. Okay, you got a minute and a half to do this.
If you got two numbers, start pushing your card.
Okay, if you have one day four numbers, the missing number is three. <laughs> Good. Okay. Did anybody end up with your own card during the last round? If you did, the keep a pocket face. Pretend it is not yours. Maintain high level of objectivity. Okay. So here is what I'm going to be doing after I check with the Yael. Oh, she is psychic. She does not have the talk. Add all of those five numbers and put the total where it says total. Does anybody have a total greater than 35, which is mathematically impossible? <laughs> we are ASTD people. Good. This activity is called 35. What do you think it is called the 35? <laughs> because it is the maximum score, highest score any part can get. Five rounds of seven. I'm going to count down from 35. When I come to the total, which is the same as the total on your page, please jump up and down. <laughs> okay. 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, tough group, 26, 25, 25. Okay, folks, listen carefully. This is the most important idea you're getting out of this workshop. <laughs> and before we ask a part to read the brilliant idea of the card, but how do we know this is the most important idea? Because you're the ones who gave the score to read. And maybe have a drum roll before we listen to the idea. Okay. Good. We are ready, Paul. Okay. Pretend you're a participant and write three objectives of what you most want to learn, then create three games or experiential exercises that will help achieve those objectives. Wonderful. And uh, what was the total? 25. 25. Okay. Now, let us do this. Pretend you are a participant and write two objectives you want to learn right now. Okay. Good. 24. Hmm. Wow, excellent, it's a popular number. We will go with you, but drum roll first. With the big picture in mind, brainstorm all the ways your learners could stretch outside of their comfort zone. Okay, this is a wonderful, fast, sadistic approach. Okay. <laughs> Ready for you, sir. We had to do a little interpretation. So the idea we think this writer meant was have someone demonstrate what the learners is supposed to do after they've taken the training oh. and take notes. Okay, good. Somebody demonstrates of the behavior expected of the learner eventually. Everybody watches and takes notes <coughs> and that follows that. Good idea. Okay. So this is a copy existing content. <laughs> okay, Please wonderful rise. idea. <laughs> and for anything and everything you want to teach, it already exists. I was telling you earlier I had to do leadership training. I found one billion documents in a Google search. You want to teach anything and everything? Subscribe to Get Abstract. Anybody know what Get Abstract is? It does a monthly free. This is a paid commission. Oh. It does monthly abstracts of some of the top selling, wonderful, conceptually brilliant business related books. 
So anything you want to teach, the content already exists someplace, and I would modify copy to say by existing material. Okay, that was 24. Any other 24? Anybody who wants to cheat and say I got the 24? <laughs> okay, 23. 22. 21. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Ray. We'll go with Brian. Drum roll, please. Okay. This was more like several ideas into one. They said first, interview end user for objectives, format, usability, create bullet point outline, consider learning activities to facilitate learning, start, don't overthink, and present the end user early and often. Okay. This is written wonderfully by a person who cannot follow instructions. <laughs> <laughs> this is good stuff. <laughs> okay. Hello, Dave. Uh, it's work off of mind maps and have SMEs, instructors, and students use them to organize ideas. Good. Create a mind map and use it as an outline. Let people use that at the core of what they are doing. Okay. Wonderful ideas, brilliant ideas, and what we have done is also demonstrate an activity. One rapid instructional design activity is save the activity, change the content. <coughs> Hello, Diane. How are you? Great. How was your uh, food? Great. <laughs> okay. She has limited vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> what do you teach then? Well, uh, I work for San Francisco Public Utilities, so right Wonderful. now I'm teaching uh, wastewater pipe inspection. Okay, <laughs> so wastewater pipe inspection. And this is what Diane says. Everybody comes in, she gives them one of these cards. She says, I want you to write on this card. I know you're not pipe inspectors yet, but pretend you're a fully qualified professional pipe inspector. Write on that card. One of the most important things every pipe instructor should do. And Anytime I say those things, I hear heavenly music. <laughs> okay. And she says, good. Let us uh, run around, exchange thoughts, distribute seven point. What is Diane doing is uh, she is doing, among other things, benchmarking. What conceptual problems do the learners have? And if they all have written the seven sacred principles of pipe inspection, she has nothing more to do. She says, you guys pass. Go inspect the pipes. And if they mess up everything and say, dig a hole through the road to find the pipe, and if it's electrical wiring and not a pipe, touch it to see if it gives you a shock or something like that. In which case, Diane can give remedial instruction. Okay, don't ever do that. Okay. Let's assume for a moment that Diane was not fast enough. She missed the opportunity. What does she do? How long is your pipe inspection class, Diane? Well, it's e-learning, and it's about four hours in many modules. How oh, very depressing. Oh, I'm <laughs> using <laughs> existing content. Yes, <laughs> more depressing. <laughs> video, lots of video. Okay, and she says, at the end of whatever, she has two challenges. One, she forgot to start it with the activity. Now it is ready to end. She says, now that you have finished that pipe inspection protocol. Here is what I want for you to do. If you meet somebody new to the pipe inspection business, what is one piece of advice would you give him? Think of all of the things you learned 
during the last four hours of cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> and write down as the most important principle of type inspection. So people type it. And there's a little button which says done. So they click on done, strange noise, and that screen is replaced by another screen and an ominous voiceover says, we have collected 12 different ideas from the previous 12 participants. You see them on the screen. Lo and behold, there are 12 ideas collected from the previous people. And the web-based training thing says, compare the idea you gave with this idea and figure out how well you did with comparison. So that is all she is doing. She has taken an instructor-led activity and made it into an e-learning activity. And it doesn't matter what you teach, you can use this activity at the beginning to see what they already know, in the end to see what they retire, in the middle just to keep them wide awake. So this is an activity which can be used only at the beginning or at the end or in the middle. You cannot use it any place else. <laughs> and my approach to rapid instructional design is have a bunch of these kinds of activities. Take the content out, plug in your own content. And if you go to my website, you will find more than 300 of these frame games, these templates with strange content. You can pull it, pull it out. My website is theagi.com, T-H-I-A-G-I.com. You're welcome to plagiarize from it. Be uh, very happy to steal anything you want and recycle it, and that is one approach. Okay, what time does this what, a session come to an end? It was said it was 8 o'clock. Okay, good. If you want to leave earlier than 8 o'clock, feel free to do so. But the session really comes to an end only when you drop dead. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's in the application important things come. And I'm going to be giving you some activities and your job is to steal them and use them until you drop them. Okay? And if you run out of those activities, just because you run out of activities, don't die. Go to my website, you will find more activities. <laughs> Good. Activity number two. Will you all stand up? You can chew, but don't take your food in your hand. Okay. Can you point to the ceiling, please? Okay, can you lower your elbow until the finger is at your shoulder level? Good. Look at the ceiling, draw a large clockwise, clockwise circle in the ceiling, pointing your finger to the ceiling, and keep pointing and circling. Do not stop, keep rotating. Bend your elbow, still rotating, still pointing to the ceiling until your finger is at your shoulder level. Look at the direction in which your finger is going. Is it blowing in the clockwise direction? You guys, don't follow instructions. <laughs> Big clockwise circle, keep circling, circling, circling. Bring your finger. Okay, cool. have a seat. This is mass delusion. <laughs> mm. What is happening? By the way, if you are in Australia, it will go the other way. <laughs> okay, so what's the explanation? Where did the finger rotation change from clockwise direction to counter clockwise direction? Point of view. Looking at. It's a point of view. See, some people are smart, and I am still looking at the no, fingers. No, <laughs> <laughs> She's 
clarify this uh, by just this. Oh, yeah. They're looking from top down this way. They're looking from bottom up that way. That's all a question of perspective. Today, one of the things uh, which is happening is uh, typically you are here as the instructor. At least Diane is here as the instructor. The rest of uh, the people are naive type of inspection personnel. Now, today, you get to be the participants and I get to be the person seated on the high chair. I forgot to bring my bib, so this is uh, what is happening. Here is one of the most important principles. In instructional technology, there is a caste system. There are high caste instructional designers and the trainers are low caste. They are not supposed to think for themselves. They are supposed to follow the instructions on the stupid trainer's manual. Here I have a suggestion on how to increase and improve your instructional design approach. You cannot be a good designer unless you also deliver what you design. This is like eating your own dog food. <laughs> you can, you, you learn the whole system only if you design something, test it out, deliver it, give it to people, find out all your brilliant ideas are stupid, people are falling asleep <laughs> in rows. So, and if you are a trainer, have the arrogance to say, I know better than the instructional designer. This stuff isn't going to work. I'm going to replace all the videotapes with the giving people a pickaxe and taking them into the uh, into Mission Street and digging up holes and looking at the pipes or something like that. You need to know the total picture. So one approach to rapid instructional design. Let me see. One of the delusions we suffer from is to teach anything and everything. There is a finite amount of content. And we give the content. Once we are given the content, everybody has become an expert. That is delusional. It's not content which makes people proficient. Content does not teach. If you are a trainer, based on giving content, you can be replaced by an MP3 recording. Mm -hmm. If you are an instructional designer, based, uh, you, uh, basing your career on cranking out uh, thousands of PowerPoint uh, slides uh, and hundreds of pages uh, of handouts, uh, you can be replaced by a copying machine. So, one of the approach, it is not content stupid, it is the activity. If you are an instructional designer, your job is to design learning activity, not content. Anybody want to argue with me? I like people who argue with me. I will give you extra dessert. <laughs> so, let me repeat one more time. Our job is to design activities, not content. And people learn how to be good pipe inspectors by inspecting pipes. The cute little video is just a peripheral material. So one approach I suggest to people is design con design activities, not content. Another reason I'm suggesting is there is an abundance of content. When I started this business, when I became an instructional designer, long before Diane was born, <laughs> we kept the content secret. What we were selling was proprietary content. Now, you want content? It is a mouse click away. And you can probably get the abstract subscription 
online. You got Wikipedia, you got search engines, any content you want, you can get content. So my suggestion is take the content that is available and wrap it around an activity, an activity that will force your learners to interact with the content, interact with each other, apply it. <clears throat> okay, and this is something you can do. Somebody tell me why this is a stupid idea. I will give you twenty dollars. <laughs> There are some times where you have to teach people, just, you just have to give them some information before they can safely go out and try to, try to do what they're Of course, yes. The key element is you give content immediately followed by that doing something. Uh, so you don't get $20 for that. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a wonderful idea I got. You got content followed by application exercise. And we call it briefing. That is one way. Sometimes you've got to do it. You can't have them digging up holes on the street without telling them how to find a pipe. And sometimes you do the activity first and then you give them the content. You say, everybody go like this. No content other than everybody go like this. Now we say, ah, it's a question of perspective. So you give, that is a debrief. <coughs> you can brief, you can debrief. You can have them do an activity in the middle. You say, stop. Have you considered that if you use both your hands, you can type faster. That is called coaching. So you need content, you need activities, and they have to be integrated. The content can come before, during, or after, and activity. So here is principle number 87. Don't give people any activity which is not immediately used, uh, which does not immediately use a content given to them. And don't give any content which is not used in an activity. You should be balancing activity and content. And Cindy says, why? Why not just give them the content to heck with the activities? Because Cindy, people don't learn by listening or reading. They learn by doing application exercises. <coughs> so you cannot train people to do things without having them do something and you give the necessary content, have them do it or you have them do it and chop up their fingers in the process and you say, let me now tell you the three important precautions. Number one, wear gloves which you protect your fingers. Number two, don't slice your fingers when you're chopping the onions things of that nature. So you've got to do content and activity. Content is available any place. <coughs> is there anybody who says, my content is not available? Yeah, some, I mean, in some cases, content is still proprietary. I mean, if... <coughs> no, Raymond, give me an example of non-existent content. Yeah, so, like, for instance, my company, after you purchase the product, mm some of the content is held behind that wall after you purchase it and it comes But the content is still that. It is behind the wall, inside. Well, the trading uh, the department creates that content and it comes, right, depending on. Oh, okay. They create the content because it resides in somebody's mind or they create it. Right. That's it's good. in the engineer's mind. And oh, okay. Now, yep. now so it's delivered and now we need to figure out how The engineer to becomes the content resource. Yeah. Here is an approach. You got an engineer who knows what it is, so we take a little video camera, sit in front of the engineer and tell me, can you give me a demonstration of how to use your software? I'm stealing an idea from one of your cards. And I create that and tell groups of people, watch what he's doing. Now you do it. 
If you cannot do it, let me know. I'm going back to the engineer and the people are not able to do it. So you bring the engineer becomes the content source. And you can archive him, you can record him or her and things of that nature, right? And instead of you doing it, why not let the participants talk directly to the engineer? And Raymond says, too expensive, we can't afford it. <laughs> By the way, in Montreal, we did training of suicide prevention hotline people. What is the best source of content to prevent teenage suicides? Someone who's tried to commit suicide. Very good. People who have done a teenage suicide, but failed in this room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and still, they're still alive. So this is what we did. We had 15 people who are being trained. We had five teenagers who tried to commit suicide, but were prevented from doing it. Ideally, we would have used the teenagers who did commit suicide, but the <laughs> reincarnation <laughs> technology <laughs> not yet had the upper. By the way, I don't believe in reincarnation, but in my previous life I used it. <laughs> <laughs> so back in Montreal, 15 people, we have five groups of three participants. We had these five people who were recruited from trying to commit suicide. And we had these five participant groups of three people each come up with interview questions for the teenagers. Each teenager went to each of these teams. They kept rotating. The teams asked them questions on what they can do to prevent, stop, or help people who are planning to commit a suicide. And the content that they created was absolutely on target. It's not an anthropologist or a social psychologist who is saying, this is what you should be doing. It is a person who was going to commit suicide who is saying, if somebody had listened to me, or if somebody had done this, I would be alive. So this is another example of content residing in, inside somebody's brain. So what we have done is looked at 20 different types of content resources. And for each of them, we have created activities, appropriate activities. For example, if the content is in the form of a text, some printed material, we have what we call extra games, games that add extra power to text materials. And we give everybody a copy, read it, which is what all college professors do, except the students don't read it and they fake it when it is time for a discussion. In this, we give people a copy of the handout and say, read it. If you don't, you'll be publicly humiliated. <laughs> we are going to do an activity. And they read it, and we tell people, when you come back to the next class, bring with me 10 cards, each with a question on the content. And I'm going to collect from these five people all of the questions you wrote and give it to these five people. Pretend that is an imaginary friend. Okay, so I just switch the questions and we do a quiz contest kind of an activity. And we say, read the question on the first card and find the answer. If you give the correct answer, you get to keep the card. Object of this activity is to keep the cards. And we tell people, read it and come up with questions. Not only that, we say, here is a job aid which helps you how to come up with good <coughs> questions. So we give samples so you don't end up getting a bunch of stupid questions. You get thought-provoking questions, things of that nature. So the content is from the text. My job as a facilitator is to let you read the text, 
do all the hard work. I just uh, sit down, take a nap, uh, do Sudoku, play with this, <laughs> and I play computer, and they do all of the hard work. So this one approach, another approach, videotape, how to inspect pipes, produced by Diane. So we have people watch the video game. Halfway we stop. And we say, pretend you are the script writers. What do you think the hero, the videotape, uh, the pipe inspector should be doing next? Sit down and create a storyboard talk among yourselves. Okay, team number one, what happens next? And uh, Caitlin says, the inspector falls down into the hole, and the hole falls on top of it at the end. And Diane says, no, never go inside the hole. Just send Brian inside the hole. <laughs> you come up with appropriate behaviors. This we call double exposure. We teach people cultural diversity. Simple approach, we take a soap opera from Brazil. Assuming you want to train people pre-departure to Brazil, we say, watch the soap opera. You can't understand the Portuguese dialogue, but try to figure out what are they talking about. Good. Now, a lot of learning, a lot of communication comes not from talking, but from gestures. And never judge a different culture's body language by using your culture's approach. You looking at it, the people say, ah, these two people are fighting with each other. And we run the video again, this time with subtitles. What they thought was a fighting scene, the hero says, your eyes look like liquid pools. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, oops, we screwed up. Uh, when they stare at each other, that means romance, not rage. So we'll have to adjust it. We, we've been doing this kind of an approach, saying, take the content from a subject matter expert, from demonstrations, from videotape, from online stuff, and uh, just uh, do the activity to wrap around it. How does this sound? Anybody want a refund? How much did they pay? <laughs> <laughs> Paul is not telling me. But Paul has a prorated system. If you got three ideas, you get 50% back. If you got 17 ideas, you'll have to pay me some more money. <laughs> Good. Now, let me design instruction. Who would like to be my guinea pig, my client? Hello. Have I ever seen you before? No. <laughs> Good. Okay. Oh, she's taking it seriously. <laughs> Have a seat. Okay. Okay. Step one, establish rapport with the client by sitting in a chair lower than the client. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks. It makes me feel superior, right? Okay, good. Hello, Terry. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I heard a lot about uh, the wonderful work you're doing. It's such a pleasure. This is called sucking up to the client. <laughs> <laughs> Don't spend uh, more than two minutes. <laughs> Hi, Teddy. What do you want to teach? Who do you want to teach it to? Oh, I need to teach um, employees how to uh, use a new software program we have, we're implementing. Oh, okay. Good. So that concludes my needs analysis and <laughs> audience analysis. Employees, new software program.
And there are people who spend three months doing this, <laughs> and finding out what percentage of your employees are left-handed. <laughs> it doesn't matter, folks. People are people. We focus so much on learning style differences. Study after study indicate they are totally useless bit of information. And if you don't believe me, go do a Google search on learning style. People who say uh, MB, you are an INFP, I'm an ESTJ, so what? People learn the same way. And if you don't uh, believe me, yell at me, and we will have a wonderful discussion. Okay. And good. So, employees, new software program. Excellent. Click, click, click. My brain is working on choosing the appropriate activities which will go with that. Hello Terry, how many of these people have to be trained? We have uh, 35 people. I was hoping 3,500, but 35 people. Not a big car drive. So, <laughs> 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 um, tell me something about the software program. What does the software program mean? enable us to do? It allows the employees to input um, their time sheets oh, and okay. their records their, when they're on the desk and when they're not at the desk. Good. And the part of me says, this is not a training program. This is a therapy program. <laughs> <laughs> Or this can be replaced by changing the management procedures how many different ways can you say, take the timesheet, push it in the hall? This is a complex software. <laughs> that is uh, what I do. I usually, depending on my bank balance, say this night, <laughs> uh, do something. But let us assume I need to pay my mortgage. This is good. Okay, you want the bank. And at the end of the program, what will show success? If my training is effective, successful, what would the employees be doing? They would uh, input their time sheets so that we could, uh, it would calculate their pay and be able to produce their payroll checks and those, uh, I like this. <laughs> Do it yourself, payroll check. Okay, <laughs> good. So they input, ah, that is the secret word. So this is a, a software application kind of program. So this is what Terry is doing. She's asking us about where does the content reside? What is the procedure for inputting stuff for explaining? Is that a manual? Is that a help screen? Is that? Um, currently, it's taught from one person to the next. So. A wonderful idea. So. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we need somebody to kind of straight organize and produce a. Um, a procedure so that everybody does it the same way. Because Wonderful. Good. Folks, this is the approach we are going to be using. Terry is going to sit down with the four of you. Judy, you are off. We want only four people. Okay. <laughs> and Dennis and Pamela, you are the green team. And Holly and Dan, you are the blue team. No, you are the red team. She's going to teach you how to input the information. How does she teach you? She has some sample data and she says that this is how you input it. Tutorial, coaching kind of a more. So far so good. Then she says, green team, red team, this is your job. You got one week. Wednesday, 2 p.m. next week, we are going to see how many people you have individually coached, taught, and things of that nature. So you're competing with each other. You're going to be teaching all of our employees 
you've got to take care of the teaching part, the recruitment part, the incentive part. Come and learn from us. Don't trust the red team. Better dead than red. So ignore them. You, on the other hand, will say, the green team, they have no clue. They are green. They are raw. They are useless. Uh, so you recruit them. You teach them. And here is the kicker. After the green team people have taught somebody, they have to be tested by the red team. Red team people will be tested by the green team. And you test as many people as possible. Wednesday, Terry randomly chooses two people taught by red team and two people taught by green team and gives them a final performance test. And if they fail, she withholds the pay of the red team. <laughs> something like that. So we are trying to find out how many people were taught. The instructional design process is simple. You need a subject matter expert for the first time to demonstrate to you. While Ted is demonstrating how to input it, I'm doing a video camera. And I'm making a video recording. I cut and edit it so Terry can be fired. Next to group of people <laughs> use the video tape and it is multi-level programming, multi-level teaching. This is like Evan or the transcendental meditation. I teach you, you teach somebody and anybody you talk can teach other people. So, this is an approach. Does this make sense? Put some more interest into it. In, interest? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we are making it interest. We still have the human touch and all those uh, flaky California type stuff. So we can uh, <laughs> do it uh, that way. So this is one approach. Okay, I need a new client. Join us, sit in the hot seat. Hi. Hi. I'm Michael. Michael, nice to meet you. I'm Veronica. <laughs> nice to meet you. Wow. Hmm. Nice name. Okay. My high-level instructional design analysis. What do you want to teach and who do you want to teach it to? Um. Well, uh, the audience is a little easier. It's about 30,000 um, software engineers. Good. Big project. <laughs> Everybody is software engineers. Okay, what do you want to teach them? Well, I, I'm not exactly sure yet, but um, it's, uh, we're rolling out uh, um, uh, new security protocols, intellectual oh. asset security protocols. Wonderful. So far, she knows the job again. Okay. Intellectual Asset Security Protocols. What does this do? Well, I mean, you know, they're software engineers. They're designing, creating, mm -hmm. um, and so they, they need to be careful with with the data, uh, with, the, um, with the things they're designing. Okay. So you don't want that one of your software engineers send the property to somebody saying, I did it on my own free time, it doesn't belong to you. And you don't want Dan to foolishly tell his girlfriend, I'm working on this software. Let me show you the lines of code. You see, <laughs> you really like a copy of this. I think you should frame it. So you want to protect it. Right, right. Okay, so this is what Veronica does. She prepares a list of things to do, things not to do. And so simple checklist. Once she has done it, she creates a bunch of scenarios. She hires my friend Diane 
to do a series of videotape showing <laughs> the software engineers talking to pipe inspectors. <laughs> She produces uh, these software engineers in the various interactions, in various places, doing various things, like Dan is uh, preparing the software, typing things, and not uh, closing his terminal before he takes a long walk in the woods. So, Veronica says, folks, we're going to have this little document. Step one. Read the checklist. If there is anything you don't understand, ask me. I will explain it. And while they are asking, she's scribbling down the questions they are asking so she can revise the checklist or produce a fax to go with the checklist. And now, just to force them to pay attention to the checklist, she does something smart. She says, look at the checklist. There are 17 items. Find, examine them, and tell me which is the most important item in protecting intellectual property. They have no clue, but that is good. They all think this is the great one. She says that each team share your thoughts and come up with consensus of which one is the most important. That's round one. Round two, look at the checklist items and decide which one is most frequently violated in our organization. There is no correct or incorrect answer. What's your opinion? Share it with your team, report it out. Number three, of all of the checklist items, which one is the stupidest sounding checklist item or counterintuitive checklist item? And so she ran some through the checklist repeatedly by making it into a small group activity. She now shows one of the videotapes and says, you saw the tape, you saw what Dan was doing in the tape, look at your checklist. He violated three principles found in the checklist. Which three did he mess up? Okay, and we keep on going scenario after scenario after scenario. Originally, you work as a team, tell me which one is being violated. Later on, you work with a partner, tell me which one is being violated. And the two hours into your training, each one will have to individually, independently write the answer. So this is your final performance test, the end. So my job as an instructional designer, Veronica's job as an instructional designer is to prepare the checklist and to prepare the scenarios. How do we prepare the scenarios? She prepares five scenarios to start with. And she says, okay, we have gone through five scenarios. Next activity, work as a team, come up with a realistic sounding scenario. You create this scenario because you are the software engineers, you know how you screw up the intellectual property regulation. So you create the scenarios, make them tough, and the things of that nature. The end, Veronica lives happily ever after and all the trainings. Okay, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with you? Oh, good. <laughs> oh, collect some more money. <laughs> <laughs> How about for reinforcement? I mean, that's, that's great for the mm. rollout, but mm. you know, this has to, you know, new people come on Good. board and so on. Exactly. So, reinforcement, if it is going to be new recruits being trained on this, establish a green team and a red team, mm -hmm. and tell them it's your job to train the new people. Alternatively, you tell the new paper, your job is to find out all the rules and regulations. I will test you using a set of scenario. You can go talk to any of our previous employees and they will be happy to teach you because I tell my previous employees who have been through the course that any time 
you help teach a new employee, you get 17 brownie points. <laughs> and if you accumulate 2,000 brownie points, you are permitted to break any of the intellectual property. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, anytime you've got 2,000, you get a BMW. <laughs> Wouldn't it take a long time to do that for 30,000? Uh, that's right. What is this? This is a blank material for writing. BMW. That is your BMW. <laughs> so, uh, one of the things you can do is you can give an incentive for the existing employees to train new employees and you collect the incentives only if you test the new employees and they are up to the uh, standards you want them to achieve. Okay, that was uh, two different differences. <laughs> yes, sir, hello. Thank you. Thank you. I have a comment about your, your idea with dealing with security. Um, you know, with intellectual property security and a lot about those things. And if you have employees teaching other employees tactics about security, I think what will happen there is they'll self-police each other a little bit better. Hmm. Where if they learn about security from the trainer, when they're back at their desk or when they're out at the bar or something like that, the trainer's not there. And they think about security as something the trainer taught me. But if they're around their teammates and they think about security as something my teammate taught me, who's sitting here right next Wonderful. to me, hmm. and I think they're going to be smarter about looking at each other and saying, he knows that I know better. Mm -hmm. Where if it's just a trainer, you'd say the trainer knows that I know better, but she's not here. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Good point. Nothing like peer pressure and peer support. <laughs> it works in religion. <laughs> <laughs> Which religion? I want to join that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. By the way, any money you collect from her, give it to Trump. <laughs> Got it. Yes, sir. If you have people teaching other people like that, I, if I was having to do that, I would also, if I was maybe a little bit negative, mm. I would also be teaching them the workarounds. It's true. Mm. It's true. All creative breakthrough ideas in any discipline came from a bunch of people who work around and screw up the policies. So thank God for people who work around. In case you don't recognize what I'm doing is I'm working around the AD model and contaminating you. You'll all be excommunicated. <laughs> we will take out the your CPLB and so on. So, by the way, some of the workarounds may turn out to be better than the other thing. But your point is very well taken. And it does create a feeling of superiority on trainers and megalomania and all of those things. So, this is basically what we have been doing as a training design. We do it very quickly and we get, oh, that is fun. Good. I'm going to ask my videographer to read all of the sacred principles. Seriously? Seriously, <coughs> but just the headlines. Okay. In the border plate. No. One at a time, and then I'm going to board people with the elaboration. Okay, number one, let the inmates run the asylum. This is the most important principle. Yeah. You want people to learn, give them control. Empower them. Give them the equivalent of a remote control. Give them permission to shut you up and say, we got it, stop yakking. Give them slow speed, high speed, things of that nature. Let the people decide what they want to learn, how they want to learn, when they want to learn. And by the way, anybody who want, doesn't like what I'm saying, yell at me. And we will have an intellectual discourse. And by the way, I, hello. Hello. Hi. Well, I, this is an example of letting the inmates run the <laughs> <laughs> Often charged with making sure that someone knows how to do a task. Yes. 
and follow a certain procedure. Exactly. But if they, need, if they don't know the procedure, how do they tell me how they want to learn it? You, you just tell them, here is the procedure I want you to do. Here is a demonstration of the procedure. How would you like for me to teach? I, maybe not the procedure, but here's the end. Well, I mean, they have to follow certain things to get there. Yes. So they can't make up how they're going to get there. The certain things they have to follow is totally an example of BLM type of thinking. BLM stands for Be Like Me. I was taught the only way to play sitar is to spend three months sitting down and trying to hold the sitar the right way. And I later found out it's all pure baloney. I can play sitar by banging it with a hammer or something like that. Uh, so that is a standard procedure. And if you want to teach it, that's OK. You, uh, let us say how to make tandoori chicken. Step one, you will have to marinate the, the chicken. That is an important principle. Step two, uh, and so on and so forth. So you can still tell them, here is the present. I'm not saying that content should be at the control of the learner. I'm saying how they want it to happen. If I say, OK, forget everything. Just tell me the steps. Or forget everything. Give me the recipe. Or forget everything. I like watching the Iron Chef. So let us have an Iron Chef contest. So that, that is what I mean. You fix what they should learn. They fix how they want to learn and how they want to demonstrate much. Thank you. You were five dollars. She is <laughs> very skeptical. <laughs> Hello, sir. If you're doing that type of approach in an industry that, uh, where compliance mm -hmm. plays a significant role, mm -hmm. people are paying significant money for participants to be in the training, and they fail the qualifications, the key element is failing the qualification. My thought is the final performance test, a valid, reliable, objective measure of final, there is no negotiating on that. How I want to teach it, I want to have the freedom. How I want people to learn, they should be given the freedom. But by the way, last two weeks ago, I was in Clinton nuclear power station con uh, controlled by info. And there is a protocol for what they should be learning. I have no problem. I don't want a nuclear meltdown in my neighboring state. And I do want them to be able to demonstrate the safety procedures. But how they learn the safety procedures, I, the input requires me to write down all my learning points, my lectures, my slides, and things of that nature. I think it is pure baloney. I don't want to use PowerPoint slides. I want to take them to a simulator. I want to teach them using a simulator. So that is all I'm saying. The final test, you give the final test. As long as it's a valid test, I'm all in compliance. Yes, and if I come back though, and I have not passed the course or the qualifications, mm -hmm. and I, I want say to be the fine. instructor allowed other learn, I was outnumbered. Mm -hmm. The learning approach was tailored to six who wanted this, and two of us wanted something else, and we didn't get what we needed, no. and that's why I failed. As an instructor, I will not let a minority or a single individual dominate. So I'm using my judgment to say, hey, you want to learn by <coughs> sleeping with the book under your pillow because you saw in National Enquirer, sleep learning is an established method. I don't want to take that. So uh, this is freedom with a tight leash. Thank you. My God, we got skeptical people. <laughs> <laughs> Hello.
Number two. By the way, there are 12 and the session ends when we reach number two. <laughs> <laughs> Content is abundant. Any content you want. By the way, my friend and improv actor, Richard Cox, who is somewhere around here, has outdone me. He goes to the client and he says, tell me what you want to teach, how many people are going to be in the class, show me the door, I'm ready to teach. Doesn't matter what topic it is, as long as I have an eye plan. And he creates content that on the fly. And he does not have to explain the content. He says, everybody go to this particular document online, which he figured it out. Or better yet, today it is on intellectual property regulations. Go do a Google search, find useful document on intellectual property regulation, talk to other members of your team, create a checklist dealing with these things of that nature. So content is coming out of the woodwork. We got two for three. One more? Yeah. Okay. It's the activity, stupid. Which primarily says don't create content. If you want to create content, get to be a college professor. Your job is not to create new content your job is to take the available content and train them. Number four. Don't reinvent the wheel. Hey, for doing activities, there are established activities. And for doing content presentation, there are established information mapping systems. You can plug in content into these activities. It isn't over, ever. <laughs> Okay, people say this is the final package, run away from that. There is no such thing as a final training package. When you think this is tested, field tested, finished, complete, God will punish you from changing the regulations, <laughs> by changing the market, by changing the technology, <coughs> by changing the type of learners who come to your workshop. Show me the cash. Uh, don't teach anything unless you can show the return on investment. Face reality. Make everything authentic. The examples you use, the final test scenarios, everything should be reality based. Don't use contrived scenarios or cases for which you can give a pat correct answer. Give real world scenarios and see if it all happens. What number was that? That was number seven. Number seven, there are five more. <laughs> you find them all out by direct inspiration tonight when you sleep. And here is what I'm going to be doing. You can go home as long as you complete the sentence. A useful thing I learned today is black. Only one regulation, you may not repeat something somebody already said. So the sooner you get over it, the happier you will be. And, okay. Good. Okay, you can go home. Uh, don't be polite, just stand up and yell. Morning okay. Use humor. Okay. Three people get five to go. Point, five point round to, to learning act. Oh. An, an activity of five points. Getting okay. into mix and mingle. Go. The students. Don't, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Don't, don't be polite. <laughs> don't be afraid to try something new. Have the students make the questions for the other students. Content does not teach. <laughs> Content can come, be, come before, during, or after the activity. Use SMEs, bring them in and let the participants interview them, learn directly from them. Give students control. 
change your perspective. Don't Good. forget to measure success. Thank you. Good. The others, I can pick your brain. <laughs> Everybody has completed the task. So, the final word, don't believe anything I say. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to do a final test in the case about 17 seconds. Everybody ready? Step one, stand up. This is a test of your latency. Step two, stretch your arms like this. Cross your arms. Turn palms to palm. Interlock your fingers. See the top. Looks like you got an extra little finger. <laughs> Step four, tap your index fingers. This is the most important step. Do exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, good. Get us on my cheetah. Step one, step two, step three, interlock. Under some pretense, scratch your head, or point to Cindy, put your hand on the other side. Now you can. Ah. Okay. <laughs> three important learning principles. Principle number one, don't trust the facilitator. <laughs> don't just listen, watch. Principle number three, knowing how I do it does not guarantee you'll be able to do it. <laughs> not done. Principle number four, start like this. This is where you want to end up. So this is the previous step. This is where you should be. So start with this and then see if you can bring your hand and put it down and teach it yourself. It takes a long time. I had a lot of fun working with you, interacting with you, playing with you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all for organizing this. Thank you Don for coming. Thank you Judy. And thank you Veronica. And thank you Terry. And thank you for willfully suspending, willfully suspending your disbelief and uh, making fools of all of us simultaneously. Have a nice evening.